What's up, Packer fans? Happy Sunday. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. I am your host, Andy Herman. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. And we are reaching the free agency period where, for the most part, anyone that Green Bay would add at this point in time probably isn't going to move the needle one way or the other. And we're also starting to kind of get the feeling that ultimately Green Bay may not have the money to spend. And I don't think I'm breaking any news here. It seems like the the money that they could have used on free agents, ultimately they decided to put into Preston Smith and Aaron Jones and for the time being, Dean Lowry. And your mileage may ultimately vary as to whether or not you feel like this was the, the best use of resources. Obviously, Kevin King, a part of that as well. Uh, but that seems to be the direction that they went in, right? So it definitely seems at this point, and when I had asked Brian Gutekunst, uh, you know, really to kick off the offseason as to whether or not they had the ability to go out and sign a major free agent if they felt it uh, was the right thing to do, he said yes. It sounds like they have ultimately felt like that was not the right thing to do, or maybe that either Preston Smith or uh, Aaron Jones was really kind of that big free agent signing, which Aaron Jones certainly would qualify as such. So again, your mileage may vary as to whether or not those were the right moves to make to improve this team to get them to the next level or not. But I think we can agree at this point that for the most part, it seems that the you know, the offseason as a whole has been about keeping this team together. Sands, Corey Lindsley, Jamal Williams, Rick Wagner, Christian Kirksey, bringing in a new draft class and hoping that you get some second and third year jumps from the players that are already on your roster, which is certainly within the realm of possibility. And if you stay healthy and David Bakhtiari comes back and plays at 100%, uh, that's certainly a leg up from what you were playing with in the playoffs as well. So, We know other teams are going to be good and better. We know that the Packers are mostly going to be the same, uh, but if everything hits in the right way, maybe they could still be a better team. But my point being today is that Green Bay is going to need some players to step up. So what my goal is today is to identify some potential options, some players on the roster that could make the same jump that Robert Tunyon did a season ago. And let's rewind about a year ago to this time Nobody, myself included, huge Bobby Tunyon stan, uh, predicted that he was on his way to a phenomenal season and probably should have been at least very much in the conversation for a Pro Bowl spot, definitely ahead of Evan Ingram, who got in the Pro Bowl, um, but had a Pro Bowl caliber season. And yes, we can question the legitimacy of, you know, just how many touchdowns he had and how much of that was a function of the offense and Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur and things like that and having a Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones that teams have to worry about. But make no mistake about it, Robert Tunyon had a great season and was a huge part of what Green Bay was able to accomplish last year. And in that same capacity, Green Bay is going to need some players to step up in the, in a very similar way this year. And you go back two years ago, they got Chandon Sullivan as a slot corner kind of playing completely out of nowhere. Lucas Patrick had a really nice season last year for the most part, completely out of nowhere. So Green Bay is going to need some players like that that step up. And as I go through this list, I'm going to go through about five players. I'm going to go through five categories and some of them have multiple players in them, but I'm going to go through five categories. I'm going to try to avoid some of the obvious ones, right? Like AJ Dillon, everyone's expecting to have a big breakout in year two as the number two back behind Aaron Jones. So he is not going to be on this list. So I'm trying to avoid any of those kind of obvious ones. Maybe one or two of these fall within that category, but um, I'm going to, for the most part, try to stay away from that. So again, I've got five categories I'm going to go through. Let's start with number five. And my number five category is, we kind of feel like we know this already, but... And that goes to John Runyon Jr. And it seems like everyone seems very confident that John Runyon Jr. is ready to come in and start this season. And as I discussed yesterday, with no David Bakhtiari right now, there's major questions, especially along the interior. Let's say Billy Turner and Elton Jenkins have to start at tackle to start the season. And yes, I am well aware there's still a draft. There's still time to add players. But as we stand here today on March 28th, Uh, you know, David Bakhtiari out. You're looking at potentially Jenkins and uh, Billy Turner on the outside, which would leave potentially two younger guys like John Runyon Jr., Simon Stepaniak, maybe a Ben Braden um, at the guard positions, and probably Lucas Patrick at the center. And I think it seems like everyone that I've seen talk about it seems very confident that John Runyon Jr. can slide in there, start, and be really good. And I don't think that that's not the case, I just don't think we can have the for sure level of confidence that a lot of people seem to have at this point. 
Did he slot in and play pretty well when given the opportunity last year? Yes. But you go back and watch it closely, there were still some major deficiencies on tape. He still lacked the overall awareness, the technique. Um, He would be a step slow at times. Better defenders would get uh, really a quick first step on him and be able to get around him. And there were a handful of plays that he just kind of you know, allowed his defender to get easily past him and make it so that the the play was basically a bust on that play. And as a rookie sixth round pick, that's what you expect. And for the for the most part, he did come in and play adequately at both left guard and right guard when given the opportunity. And me, like probably you and just about everyone else, I am very bullish on his future as a Green Bay Packer. I do think that he projects as a potential long-term starter at guard for this team with potentially some positional versatility as time goes on as well. I do really like what I see out of him, but I'm also not willing, you know, willing at this point to say you can slot him in at left guard and that problem is solved, or you can slot him in at right guard and that problem is solved. With a full offseason, mini camp, OTA, training camp, preseason, you know, I do expect him to get near that level. And I do think Green Bay probably has some confidence that he's going to be able to start this season. Um, but I do still think he needs to take a jump. And maybe it's not quite the jump that Bobby Tunyon took a season ago, but I do still think in order for him to really solidify one of those spots in Green Bay to be as good. Remember, if Elton Jenkins has gone at that left, you know, left guard spot and he's either filling in at center for Corey Lindsley, let's just say long term that's the solution, right? That that Jenkins is the long term center. Then, you know, John Runyon Jr., to fill that gap, you know, there's a there's probably a pretty big difference between Elton at left guard and John Runyon Jr. at left guard. So if he can take that step and get near that level, then I think again, a lot of us think he can get to, maybe not this season. I think my guess would be that he's maybe closer to that a year from now, maybe two years from now. But if he can get closer to that level this season, that would be a huge win for the Packers. So what John Runyon does this offseason and heading into this season and how he's able to perform really could be a a major piece of trying to solidify an offensive line that's missing Corey Lindsley and uh, you know has lost Corey Lindsley and is potentially missing David Bakhtiari for the per- first part of the season. So John Runyon Jr., we think we kind of know that, but we're not there quite yet. So that's why he is on this list. Number four, the H-back position. And two players here, of course, Josiah DeGuara, third round pick a season ago, but coming back from a really serious injury. And then Dominique Daphne, somebody who looked like he's actually a real 53-man roster player and should be uh, in contention for making this team moving forward. I was really impressed with what Daphne was able to provide you know, in limited time a season ago, uh, to the point where I'm not totally sure that he's not a step ahead of Jay Sternberger when it comes to roster positioning right now. Now, we're a ways away from that, and there's a lot of offseason left, but Daphne's definitely well within that conversation. And these are two players that have great athleticism. They're you know, they're unique in what they can do. They can play some tight end, they can play some H back, they can play some full back, you can split them out wide. These are peak Matt LaFleur type players. And even more so, I think if you have two of them, you could even potentially do some more with those type of players. Plus, they're both probably core special teams type of players moving forward. These are two players that, again, I'm not sure that they're ready to take a Robert Tunyon type jump where, you know, all of a sudden they're catching, you know, double digit touchdowns or are Pro Bowl caliber players. But these are two players with a lot of talent and scheme versatility and playing a role that is a, that means a lot to Matt LaFleur in this offense. So these are two players. And even if they can just hit on one of them and one of them takes a major jump this season, that would be a big win for Green Bay. But next up on that list, again, Dominique Daphne, as well as Josiah DeGuara. Number three on my list are the the bad relationship players. These are players that I have been hurt by and you've been hurt by and we've been hurt by uh, multiple times now over the course of the last couple of years, but I'm just not ready to give up on the relationship quite yet. And that is Shannon Sullivan and Mark Valdez scantling Both of these players, and especially MBS, and I have been, I last year, when people were getting excited about MBS, I said, I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon until he proves me right for an entire season or proves me wrong for an entire season and can go out and play consistent football. I am, I'm going to stay off that bandwagon because he had opportunities in 2018, couldn't make the most of it. 2019, couldn't make the most of it. 2020, we saw a lot of opportunities, a lot more good, but certainly some crushing drops and fumbles and some key spots last season as well. Now what happens in 2021? And as much as it uh, you know, as I'm cautioning myself, even saying this, 
I have a lot of faith in MVS going into this season. I really feel like he has turned a leaf. Now, he is still going to be a heartbreaker from time to time. I don't have any doubt about that. But I also feel like he has become a true explosive threat on the outside. He was one of the only players that was really threatening that Tampa Bay defense in the NFC Championship game. Had the big touchdown. If Rodgers would have hit him in stride a couple more times, he may have even had a monster game. It could have been ultimately the game changer that changed the outcome of that game. I know he's had some trouble with hands, but I thought he played with stronger hands a season ago. It's a confidence thing. It's a concentration thing, but he has all the talent that's there. We'll see what 2021 brings. But again, if there's somebody that, if you told me that there's a player that's on his first contract that made a major jump and was either close to or made a Pro Bowl this season, I would put all of my money on that player being MVS. On the flip side, Shannon Sullivan loved what he did in 2019. I thought he was a legit, legit, you know, slot corner in 2019 when given an opportunity. 2020 struggled mightily at the beginning of the season, calmed down a little bit towards the middle of the season, and then struggled again towards the end of the season. I want to see that 2019 Shannon Sullivan and that middle of the year 2020 Sullivan come out, really play at a high level. I like what he brings to the table. He's an aggressive tackler from the slot position. He's big enough. He's mostly quick enough. You're not going to want him to stick with some of the really shifty guys too often, but plays well in zone, can man up in certain situations, provides some safety versatility. I like Sullivan. I would have liked to have seen, and I would still like to potentially see somebody to come in and challenge him for that position, but I still think there's more to give than what Shannon Sullivan has this past year, and I still think he could make a jump in the the coming season or two. Next up is the young safeties, Henry Black and Vernon Scott. And I don't think anyone's confident enough to say exactly what Green Bay has in these two young safeties, but Vernon Scott definitely feels like a Raven Green type, you know, hybrid nickel linebacker slash safety. He is big, he is physical, he's athletic. Um, Not the maybe most shiftiest guy in the world, but uh, I think he actually provides better safety versatility than what I expected coming out. Again, being a bigger, more physical safety, um, he can lay the lumber, he can play on special teams. I like his upside and I'm excited to see what he's going to be able to bring to the table. And I think there's a real chance if Green Bay doesn't add another player that he could legitimately take that role from Raven Green with Raven Green, of course, not being on the roster right now. So excited about Vernon Scott and even Henry Black. The player that Henry Black reminds me a little bit of, and this may frighten people a bit, but is early Kentrell Bryce. And that name is going to be scary because the end of Kentrell Bryce was not great at all. But early Kentrell Bryce was really intriguing to the point where he looked like he was going to be a legitimate starting safety and was a good backup safety and great special teamer early in his career. And again, very physical, hard hitter, could make an impact play here and there. If if Henry Black shows some of that same sort of skill, um, he could really earn a spot on this team, and and hopefully the end you know ends better than what Kendrell Bryce did. But um, I'm excited about both of these young safeties and just seeing if one of them could take that next step for Green Bay, be that hybrid nickel you know linebacker, play a little safety when needed, and, and give some depth to that position where right now behind Darnell Savage and Adrian Amos, there's a lot of question marks. So really excited about the two and seeing what they're going to be able to bring to the table this season. And then last but not least. To me, the future linebacker of this team, Chris Barnes. And I know for a lot of people that may be Kamal Martin, but I think what I saw on tape a season ago was a player in Chris Barnes that was a solid two or three steps ahead of Kamal Martin. I thought the team was at their best when Chris Barnes was that inside linebacker on defense. He is posi- you know, he's the one linebacker that they had a season ago where you could keep him on the field every down. You didn't have to take him out in passing situations. You didn't have to take him out in running situations. Is he the ideal 1A linebacker at this point? Probably not, but he's a, he's a really good football player with good instincts, good enough quickness, good enough coverage, good enough run stopping. And I really think that he can put together a really nice career in Green Bay as a starting inside linebacker. I know a lot of us, myself included, would like to see a little bit more speed and athleticism and an influx of talent at that position. I just don't see Green Bay going premium pick. We know that, well, first of all, even if they wanted to spend big on a free agent, there are no good free agent inside linebackers left on the market, period, end of story. So, you know, you could bring in like a KJ Wright as more of a, you know, off-ball linebacker. You could do something like that. Pair him with Chris Barnes. I would love that, frankly. I think those two would pair really well together. But I think in that core inside linebacker, green dot on the back of the helmet, calling the plays, being the guy that you don't have to sub out in certain situations. 
I see that as Chris Barnes moving forward. And if he could take that jump and start playing as a near Pro Bowl level, level player like Tunyon did, man, that would be huge for the interior of that Packers defense. And it would really set them up for success and taking that jump and maybe be able to make a real run towards the Super Bowl in 2021. So John Runyon Jr., Dominique Daphne and Josiah DeGuara, Shannon Sullivan and MVS, Henry Black, Vernon Scott, and then of course, Chris Barnes. Those are the guys I'm keeping an eye on to potentially the under the radar guys, right? Not your AJ Dillons, your Savages, your Rashawn Garys, those type of guys. We know all the talent is there and the hope is that all of those guys take a significant jump this season. Uh, but these are more some under the radar like Bobby Tunyon was a season ago. And hopefully one or two of these guys break out in a major way and again, maybe threaten, maybe not for a Pro Bowl spot, but at least really jump out on the scene and provide to be a very, very good starter for the Packers moving forward. That's going to do it for me. Make sure to check out today's audio podcast wherever you get your favorite audio podcasts. I'll be right back here tomorrow, so subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!